Grace and peace to you from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. We'll give our attention again to Luke chapter 24, Jesus' first appearance to his disciples on Easter Sunday evening. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. This is the gospel of our Lord. Dear brothers and sisters, to to give ourselves an an impression of, of what it was like for Jesus' disciples on that first Easter Sunday evening, let's, let's put ourselves into the shoes of a five-year-old whose parents, um, how shall I say this, whose, whose parents aren't exactly winning any awards. Like there was that, that time last summer vacation when they, they stopped for gas, and it wasn't until they were back on the expressway that they noticed that the car was a little quieter than usual and something was missing from the back seat. And then there was that other time when he was, when he was two and he wandered out the back door, and a couple hours later when a neighbor rang the doorbell holding their, their son, they, uh, they hadn't even realized he was missing. Whenever they drop him off at a friend's house, he's always sick to his stomach about whether they're going to remember to pick him up. Well, now it's, his, now it's his first day of kindergarten. And mom and dad put him on the bus and they reassure him, don't worry at all, son. Mommy and daddy are going to be right here waiting for you after school. Oh, but he's still sweating the entire day because he knows how this is going to turn out. He's not going to be surprised at all if no one is there at the bus stop. In fact, he'll be shocked if they do come through for him. Well, that's got to be pretty close to the way Jesus' disciples felt on the first Easter Sunday evening. And and not the way way that, that they should have felt, but the way that they felt nonetheless. They they knew their Bibles. They knew what the Bible said about the Messiah. And on top of that, Jesus had explained the game plan to them in detail many times beforehand. Very frankly, told his disciples, we are going to Jerusalem. And when we get there, uh, I'm going to suffer many things and be rejected and be killed. And on the third day, be raised to life. He hadn't kept any of this a secret. He hadn't spoken in any riddles. But but still on Easter Sunday evening, what surprised the disciples? It wasn't a report that Jesus was still dead in his grave. What what shocked them, what, what frightened them, was that Jesus actually did exactly what he said he'd do. They're locked up in a room, sick to their stomach with worry, but unlike our five-year-old, not our five-year-old, but you know, our hypothetical five-year-old, unlike the five-year-old, it, it's not because Jesus had proven his unreliability. Well, he's, he's let us down so many times in the past. Why should we expect it to be any different this time? Not at all. So why are they so scared? Everything's going according to plan. You know, especially when you consider, especially the everything that had already happened that day. Those, those women 
who had gone to Jesus' tomb to pour perfume on his corpse. They find that the stone has been rolled away, and instead of finding a corpse there, they find angels there. Remember what they did? They run back, and they tell the disciples. And then the disciples are like, no way, no way. You ladies, you're talking nonsense. Peter and John run to the tomb to see for themselves, and they find burial clothes, but no buried body. What else happened on Easter Sunday before this? Mary Magdalene, she had a face-to-face conversation with the living Jesus. And then later on in the afternoon, there were two men walking along the road, and then Jesus was walking alongside them, had a long conversation with them. When they realized that it was Jesus, remember what they did? They ran back and told the disciples. That's exactly what they were talking about right when Jesus appeared to them. Everything that was going on, the prophets had foretold it. Jesus had explained it. Now they had up to the minute eyewitness testimony. Why are they so scared? The five-year-old with inattentive parents, well, he has legitimate reasons to be afraid that his parents aren't going to come through for him. But Jesus' disciples, why are they so scared? Well, to to borrow the the language of the passage, uh, it's because they're closed-minded. I picture it this way. The facts, the facts were up here. But still, what they had seen and experienced over the last three days, it was really hard. So doubts were rising up from their hearts into their heads and interfering with the facts in their brains. And since their minds were closed, there was nowhere for those, facts, for those doubts to go except to bounce around in their insides and fill them with fear. And I, I imagine that you can relate from the, the crises in your own life when, when life is difficult and uncertain, and I mean, I mean the really hard times, it's, it's, not like, it's not like we instantly forget everything that we've ever read in the Bible and everything that we've memorized from the catechism. Adam and Eve and Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, Peter, James and John, the Ten Commandments, the Lord's Prayer, the Apostles' Creed, baptism, the Lord's Supper, but... But does it ever seem to you like all those things are like 5,000 puzzle pieces just floating around in your mind? Like you know the facts, but the facts don't seem to be helping. Maybe, maybe you've noticed it when, when you've done something or, or haven't been able to stop doing something that you're pretty sure disqualifies you from Christianity. And and you know the facts. You know that Jesus died on the cross to pay for the sins of the world and that you're part of the world. Um, you, you, You know that God put his name on you when you were baptized and that he calls you his own. You, you know the facts. But you also can't forget what you've done or what you haven't been able to stop doing. And those doubts and fears, they, 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 they bounce around on your insides and the guilt won't go away. Or, or, or maybe you've, you've noticed it when, when your life has been in a chapter of just one disaster after another. The problems are piling up, and, and your worry is through the roof, and you're at the, you're, you're at the point where you can barely function anymore because you're about to break. And then something else happens, and it makes it even worse. You know the facts. God's promise that he uses such trials to draw us closer to him. And that no matter how bad it is, never will he leave you. Never will he forsake you. And, and you, and you know that, that Jesus ascended to God's right hand and is ruling over all things in heaven and on earth for the good of his church. You, you know all those facts. And, and maybe that almost makes it worse. Because you know that your faith should be stronger, but it isn't. And it just gives you something else to feel inadequate about. 
Well, at least we know how Jesus' disciples felt on Easter Sunday evening. In spite of Jesus' patient instruction, in spite of the eyewitness accounts, doubt and fear still ricocheted all over the place in their insides. And then even when, when Jesus made his grand entrance, they don't breathe a sigh of relief. Ah, oh, phew, Jesus really did what he said he'd do. No, they're like, ah, oh, it's a ghost. But look at what Jesus did to take away their fears and their doubts. Well, after they, they saw him and touched him and watched him eat some fish because ghosts can't eat fish, what did Jesus do? He told them again what he'd already told them. This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. And then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He wasn't just giving them information. He was giving them understanding. As if everything he had taught them before was like 5,000 puzzle pieces floating around their heads. And Jesus put it all together so they could understand the picture. He opened their minds. And as the understanding poured in, well, the doubts and the fears came out. Today, Jesus shows us what he does for us when everything that we know about him doesn't seem to be doing us any good. He does the same thing that he did for his disciples. He opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. You open up your Bible, you listen to a sermon, and, and maybe you don't learn anything that you haven't heard a hundred times before. But Jesus isn't just giving you information. He's giving you understanding. He's, he's putting together the puzzle in your mind. He's, he's using the information to strengthen your faith. when you're convinced that you've crossed the line, that what you've done or what you haven't been able to stop doing has disqualified you from Christianity, and now it's too late. It's like he opens your minds as for the very first time to understand what it means for you, that, that Jesus died on the cross and paid for the sins of the world. Well, that also means that he paid for all of yours. Or when it's been just one disaster after another and, and, and you're about to break and you can't take anymore and you're wondering why. Well, he uses what's in your, in your head and on the pages of your Bible to open your minds anew and to teach you again what it means that he's ruling over all things in heaven and on earth for the good of the church. That it's not just the church in general, but it's for you in particular, for your good. The, the peace that God gives through Jesus Let's make sure we realize this, that, that it's not hidden in the nooks and crannies of the Bible where only scholars can go. No, it's written on every page, plain English. When Jesus opened his disciples' minds so they could understand the scriptures, did you notice how simple it was? This is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. That's Bible basics that any of our smallest children can tell you. Jesus died for you. 
Jesus rose for you. Jesus lives for you. And if, if that ever seems trite, and if it ever seems too elementary for your big problems, then how about, how about you go back and you listen again on every page and pray that Jesus would give you understanding and open your mind through any will. Maybe just going back little by little. Adam and Eve, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Peter and James and John. And let Jesus put all those puzzle pieces together in your mind and plant them in your heart. How it all connects together. How it all connects to you. What he's done for you. What he's doing for you. The glory that he has in store for you at the end. It's one of my, my favorite devotion books. Uh, members of the church council will recognize it. It's called uh, On Giving Advice to God. Written by uh, my favorite professor in college. Um, he actually died just a few months ago, went to heaven, uh, COVID. Uh, I'm glad that Jesus gave him the time to, to write it before he died. It's a, it's a book of, of meditations on how God does things so differently from how we would do them if we were in charge. And good thing. Uh, we could probably all come up with a, a list, at least a short list, of things that we would do differently. Maybe it's a long list. And uh, I remember sitting in class, he, he liked to talk about how I think we all feel sometimes, especially when we're going through the moments of crisis, that, well, when I get to heaven, I can't wait because I'm going to ask God to explain to me why he did this or that, why he let me feel so depressed and alone in my most vulnerable years, why he let my mom die when I was young, why, why he let me get cancer. I, th I think we could all come up with at least a short list. But then he also liked to muse about what it will actually be like when God brings us into glory and we stand in his presence and we're able to see how he used all things in heaven and on earth for our eternal good. He said, you know, instead of getting up there and being, pulling out our list of grievances and starting to ask God to explain himself, that we'll be more like, Oh, now I see. Yeah, God really did know what he was doing. Even when it was really hard, even when I was convinced to the contrary, he really kept his promises. And his promises, every one of them, was good. Surprise! It's just like God said. Amen. Please stand.